Good afternoon and welcome to our last lecture. Um, this, if you recall, is the uh, Europe that existed in 1914. And then uh, in January of 1919, the war having been over, Germany having, Germany having surrendered conditionally, unlike in World War II, uh, the conditions pertaining uh, to uh, President Wilson's uh, 14 points and his other speeches emphasizing uh, self-determination of all peoples and uh, uh, other uh, uh, general provisions implying equal justice for, for victors and for the vanquished. Uh, that was the spirit that uh, Wilson publicly proclaimed, and it was on that basis that the Germans surrendered. Um, and then in January of 1919, the leaders of the Entente uh, get together in Paris. In, uh, 19, in 1814 and 1815, the last time there had been a general European um, conference uh, to settle questions at the end of the uh, French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, uh, the victorious powers, the coalition that had defeated Napoleon, were there, but equally the um, uh, French were represented there by Talleyrand, uh, who took part in the uh, negotiations together with everyone else. The spirit in, in Vienna in, 19, in 1814, uh, 1815, was the rational one, which is that uh, they're going to have to live with France on the same continent. They can't simply exclude France and, uh, and uh, create a dictated peace. Uh, so that the French had to be let, let in in the negotiation. The Talleyrand, as clever as he was, was able to manipulate things uh, to the interests of his own country. In 1919, in Paris, it was quite different. Uh, there were German representatives, but they were put up in a hotel and under guard and not permitted to take any part in the negotiations uh, uh, and the creation of the, uh, of the peace treaties. There... Um, uh, when the uh, peace treaty with Germany was finally settled upon, um, the Germans were brought out to the Palace of Versailles under guard uh, and told to sign the treaty, and that was it. They, ref they refused at first, but were um, threatened with an invasion of Germany. The Germans had totally disarmed by that time at armistice, uh, on Armistice Day, had no artillery, had no guns, had no uh, planes, uh, the army uh, was demobilized. Uh, whereas the uh, uh, Allies still had their armies, uh, so that the threat of invasion of Germany was a very real one and enough to force the German representatives to give in, uh, regardless of uh, their own personal feeling. In Germany, everybody, from the communists to the extreme nationalists, uh, there weren't exactly any Nazis uh, by that time, but the people on the extreme nationalist side, everybody, the Catholics, the socialists, the liberals, uh, everybody was against uh, the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, nonetheless, it was uh, uh, implemented. The, the history of the uh, peace conference is uh, uh, of great interest. And uh, it shows that time and time again, uh, Wilson, who was surprised, who was uh, astonished uh, that somehow uh, his wartime allies seemed to be interested in acquisition of colonies and uh, uh, advantages over the uh, over the defeated powers, rather than uh, to welcome the new German democracy as a, a sister uh, democracy and so on. He was, um, uh, he was very hurt. In the middle of the conference, he got a stroke, had to go back to uh, America, and then recovered a bit and came back. Um, but uh, time and time again, when he uh, uh, tried to set himself up against uh, uh, some position of the French or the British, uh, they threatened not to go along with his his, his baby, his dream, his vision of the League of Nations, and that was enough to have him cave in. So that um, the peace treaty was signed with the defeated powers, one uh, treaty with each of the uh, in each of the great palaces in the vicinity of Paris, um, and the uh, uh, the most important one at the most important palace, the uh, treaty with Germany at uh, the Palace of Versailles. The treaty with Germany included an article. Uh, 231, unprecedented in the history of uh, peace treaties, whereby the Germans um, uh, acknowledged on behalf of themselves and their allies the sole responsibility for having started the war. Um, it hadn't been considered really a very gentlemanly thing to do. Once you have defeated and, and knocked down an opponent, then to force him to grovel further uh, and uh, admit that uh, he was the one that started everything. 
Now this, let's see if I still know how to use this. Yep, there we go. This is uh, the Europe we started with, and this is now the new Europe. The most um, um, obvious thing is the creation of a series of successor states down here, uh, successors to the, uh, in part to the old Tsarist Empire, uh, in part to, to Germany in the sense that the German section of Poland um, now became part of Great Poland, and mainly in uh, successors to the Austro-Hungarian Empire over here. Winston Churchill, to give him credit, uh, lamented the end of Austria-Hungary. Uh, he said it could have been reformed, and it provided a, um, a, uh, a home for all of the small peoples of Central Europe to live together and to lend each other moral support and, and uh, uh, if necessary, uh, a military support belonging to, to the same uh, empire. Instead, what you had were small peoples, uh, the Czechs, the Slovaks, uh, Austrians and Hungarians divided, um, and, uh, and the big Poland, but still between Germany and, and Russia. And these small peoples in the interwar years and after the Second World War <laughs> fell victim, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, to Germany at first and then to Russia. Uh, by themselves, in other words, uh, when uh, Germany and Russia were interested in absorbing them, they, did, they, they simply couldn't hold out. There was some, uh, you can read in my uh, essay, again, some, uh, some things which are, uh, particularly uh, disturb the Germans. And uh, it has to do with really many of the different uh, um, parts of the Treaty of Versailles. But in regard to self-determination, uh, here the Polish corridor did include many Germans, uh, as did uh, Upper Silesia over here, uh, for uh, uh, just to do justice to the treaty, it would, would have been very difficult to cleanly divide off Germans from Poles there. Uh, however, over here, we have a totally German territory called Danzig, which was made into a little country of its own, a free state under Polish uh, control. Uh, the point being that Poland now having a corridor to the sea needed a seaport they could depend on uh, on the Baltic, which was Danzig. But it was a totally German city, and self-determination didn't hold for them. The more important uh, uh, cases of uh, lack of self-determination for the Germans were in the Sudetenland, this area here around Czechoslovakia, uh, where there were about three and a half million Germans. Out of the total population of this new country, Czechoslovakia, of around 12 million, there were more Germans than Slovaks in Czechoslovakia. Uh, the uh, Germans in the Sudetenland did not wish to be part of this Slavic state, uh, although not only Slavic, Hungarians there, uh, Ruthenians, well, Slavs there. Uh, the Germans did not want to be part of Czechoslovakia, but they were denied self-determination. Austria was prohibited from joining with Germany, um, although the Austrians said, look, what are we now? We're uh, uh, some Alpine provinces and uh, some big city of Vienna, all Germans. All the non-German territories are taken away. We want to be part of the Reich. But, it, uh, but uh, the uh, treaties with Austria and the treaty, with, treaty of Versailles with Germany prohibited that. So here, blatant violations of the principle of self-determination. Uh, here the, uh, in the South Tyrol also, uh, about a quarter of a million Germans put under Italian control. But... Uh, so it seemed to uh, almost it seemed to virtually all Germans um, um, a, an act of hypocrisy. The Germans were divided between those who said, "Well, we have to live with it; we lost," and those, those who said, "Well, we're not going to live for it, live with it for very long. We're going to change it as soon as we can." So this was, and the German colonies were divided up. Most very importantly, and the most important colonies were the Arab territories of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, here, Turkey as a Turkish land comes into existence, and this, uh, this map doesn't show the Arab uh, lands of the, uh, of the uh, former Ottoman Empire, uh, but those, that take, those are either uh, directly or indirectly under British and French control. The French take over Syria, 
And uh, in order, uh, there's a, a Christian minority in, in Syria at the time. In order to create a Christian state in the Middle East, they carve out of Syria something that had not existed before called Lebanon with a Marianite Christian uh, majority in order to have this um, uh, uh, kind of wedge in the uh, Muslim Arab world. So that Lebanon and the problems that Lebanon has experienced since then uh, are uh, traceable to this division. Um, the British, uh, oil has already been discovered at Mosul. The British create something called Iraq. Uh, and in order uh, uh, that the Iraq should be uh, uh, less uh, potent than it might have been otherwise, they arbitrarily create something called Kuwait uh, out of uh, a, a formerly a, a territory that had been part of the, uh, the same area as Iraq administered by the Turks. And this uh, Iraq that they uh, create is a non-country with uh, non-Arabs in the north, Kurds, and the strongly divided Arab, Arab Muslims in the center and the south, Shiite and Sunni Muslims. Um, <laughs> nonetheless, it's made into, an, uh, into a country. Uh, King is put in charge and they, uh, has a very uh, uh, tortured history because how else do you, put, you keep together a, a, a non-country like this except through dictators? <laughs> Uh, one way or the other, and sometimes dictators who act extremely brutally. Uh, the, uh, uh, the House of, uh, of Saud is uh, uh, given its reward um, for uh, supporting the uh, British against the Turks in the creation of something called Saudi Arabia. Most ominously, um, the um, uh, Ottoman territory of Palestine is taken over as a mandate a colony by Britain. And in the course of the war, the British, in order to gain all the support they could, uh, promised on the one hand that the Arab states would be free and independent so that they could uh, raise up the desert Arabs against the Turks. And on the other hand, promised, promised uh, Zionists that Palestine would become a homeland uh, uh, for Jews. Not exclusively for Jews, because the Balfour Declaration, where uh, this was expressed, uh, said that uh, the rights of the uh, present inhabitants of Palestine should be should be uh, respected. Nonetheless, Balfour was a was a uh, um, a, uh, a high member of the British Foreign Office. Um, nonetheless, the first international recognition the Balfour Declaration, while the war is going on, of the claims of the Zionists. And the creation then, of, or the beginning of the creation of a Zionist uh, state uh, in Israel, a state uh, in uh, Palestine. The state is not going to be uh, declared until 1948, but nonetheless this uh, gave a, uh, an opening for increased Jewish immigration into this Arab uh, country. Uh, a League of Nations was set up. Uh, although the United States never joined, and as I mentioned before, the story that you all heard is that there was a terrible uh, tragedy that the United States did, had, uh, did not join the League of Nations. But uh, I don't have a map of the world right here to show you the division also of the German uh, colonies, the few German colonies. Uh, but uh, here you can see what happened in Europe. How did the world look uh, in uh, 1919? as far as the great powers were concerned. Well, Russia had been taken over by the Bolsheviks, so it was at least temporarily outside of the uh, family of nations anyway. Did not have to be... And the Bolsheviks, of course, were concern, were involved in their own civil war and their own civil disturbances, so they were hardly a, site, uh, a factor. Uh, Austria-Hungary didn't exist anymore. Germany was down, and um, the French and others hoped uh, was out permanently. So the League of Nations then, which um, established the principle that aggression meant crossing borders, was an instrument to eternalize Anglo-French world hegemony. The borders were fine. The borders of the world were fine as far as the British and the French were concerned. This is the way it should be and this is the way it should stay. And the League of Nations now was this peacekeeping organization dedicated to preserving the borders of 1919. Uh, if, they got the, if they had gotten the United States into this, then the Americans would have been obliged to uh, uh, lend, uh, when necessary, military support to the preservation of this Anglo-French world hegemony. That's the, the fact of the matter. 
uh, as many realists in the United States and elsewhere uh, saw it. Now, um, this is only one example of, uh, well, so much for our maps. Ha. This is only one example of, and I've taken World War I because it's a very well-known example. A lot is known about the war. It's very interesting on other grounds. It's very significant because of its consequences. But this is one example for, of, the, uh, of the burning need for revisionism, what's called revisionism. Um, I don't know how much anybody would be willing to bet me, but I'd be willing to bet a lot, uh, even more than the uh, $250 I'm getting for these 10 lectures from the Mises Institute. Um, I'd be willing to bet a lot that the President of the United States had never heard the word revisionism before he recently gave, him, gave a speech saying that people uh, who would uh, deny the, Amer- the administration's position on why we got into war in Iraq and so on are guilty of revisionism. I think that sounds more like uh, Pearl or Wolfowitz or, or um, uh, maybe even Cheney. Um, but revisionism, as it, as it re- uh, pertains to historical interpretation, is an absolute ne- necessity. What's the alternative to revisionism? The alternative to revisionism is to, is to simply to believe the victorious state's story about how the war began, how it was conducted, and what the consequences of the war were. To believe the propaganda that a, a state involved in war necessarily always puts out, always tries to spread. And unless that's revised in some way, then what we're left with is simply very childish uh, uh, lies, a tissue of very childish lies. So revisionism, to one degree or another, is absolutely called for, absolutely necessary in regard to every war. <laughs> if we take the last good war, the uh, war everybody uh, likes, World War II, uh, there's been necessary revisionism in regard to that. I mean, of course, there's, there's re- revisionism of the school I agree with and, and, and Joe and, and others here, but there's been revisionism even among mainstream historians. Nobody now believes uh, the story that was told during the war and right after the war that Franklin Roosevelt worked tirelessly for peace uh, right until he was totally stunned and surprised by the Japanese uh, attack on American forces in Pearl Harbor, the Philippines, and elsewhere. That was the American government story. Nobody believes that. As a matter of fact, the people who like Roosevelt uh, say, no, you know, he, he did plan to get us into war uh, with Germany and uh, turned out with Japan also. Uh, he had to do it very slowly because of the isolationist American public, but he did plan to do it, and he was right to do it because um, uh, Nazi Germany was such a threat, uh, especially as perceived to be al- allied with the Japan, that we had to get into that war. So that there's been revisionism even among, even in the mainstream story um, in regard to World War II and in regard to many other wars. How, I don't understand how anybody thinks that uh, uh, they can maintain the uh, story of, of the Vietnam War now that uh, people like uh, McNamara say that, uh, well, you know, I, now we really had no idea why we went into Vietnam. Um, and, uh, and it turned out really to be kind of a mistake. Sorry. Um, the, secret, the man who was the secretary, secretary of Defense and the chief impetus in favor of that war in the Johnson administration. Uh, so that um, um, revisionism, as I say, uh, is necessary. The um, uh, state engages in propaganda constantly, especially in regard to war. And the reason for this um, is clear. As um, uh, the French philosopher <coughs> Laboisi, I think Chantal is, is familiar with this uh, writer, a friend of... of um, who wrote Gargantua and Pantagruel? Talk about forgetting. R- Rabelais. Oh, no, he was a friend of Montaigne. Yeah. A, a close friend of Montaigne. And Montaigne actually wrote an uh, essay uh, on friendship uh, in connection with La Boissy, who died fairly young. But La Boissy wrote a, uh, a, story, uh, a, 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 a tract uh, that uh, has actually been translated, I think, more than once into English, available 
uh, from libraries, if, uh, if not in print, uh, about how the state depends totally uh, on, on opinion. Um, the ruler is just one person or you know, a small number of people. Even his supporters are a limited number of people. The ones who are ruled are the vast majority. How are they going to be ruled by a relatively small number except through opinion, through instilling uh, in them, uh, planting in their minds uh, the, uh, uh, legitimacy, uh, the, legitimate, um, the legitimacy of the state and the arguments for state control. Uh, so this uh, is done through glorifying the state's wars. Uh, isn't it funny how, uh, with the possible exception of Vietnam, all of, American, uh, all of America's wars have been, have been justified, have been right, have been good? Uh, I mean, uh, isn't, what are the odds of something like that? A major power, as every war has been, uh, uh, has been good. Um, and um, uh, the enemy has always been uh, unbelievably horrible. Um, uh, Orwell's 1984 is indispensable still for this. The way uh, uh, hate against the enemy is, uh, is whipped up, the five-minute hate, uh, showing the... Uh, uh, if they're, it's easier against when, the, when Oceania is fighting um, uh, East Asia because they're Asians, right? And they can be made into grotesque uh, Mongol... Uh, type uh, demons and so on, bloodthirsty cannibals practically, but even uh, uh, Eurasia with the Slavic people and uh, and their inveterate uh, uh, bloodlust and uh, <laughs> and traditional can- traditional cannibalism. Um, or we'll show th- this is this is how the, the citizens of what used to be Britain and America and so on are presented. But the this is what the enemy is like: bayoneting babies all the time and so on. That was uh, that was started with the Belgian atrocity stories of 1914. Uh, the um, uh, uh, really uh, maybe the first great propaganda uh, uh, success in uh, in modern times. At uh, my apartment um, in Buffalo, I have a poster selling Liberty bonds. And it shows a burning village in the background, and it shows a, a big hulking uh, a German soldier with his uh, Pickelhaube helmet. And he's dragging along a what, 10, 11-year-old girl uh, into the bushes. It said, and it says, "Remember Belgium, buy Liberty bonds." Um, this is uh, this was part of the deliberate campaign of the of the British government, brilliantly successful. So that Hitler talks about it in Mein Kampf, and Goebbels says that uh, that uh, he learned a tremendous amount about propaganda from the British. So the so the, so the um, uh, government keeps telling everybody how horrible, how uh, uh, demon-like the enemy is, how uh, totally virtuous uh, we are, good and evil, uh, the way we, we're being told about it all the time now, uh, and uh, 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 the government's uh, the government has certain heroes who are set up. As exemplary uh, models of uh, humanity, uh, monuments are set up to them in Washington. They're going to run out of room after a while. I mean, even uh, the D.C. is a pretty limited area now. With what is it, seven and a half acres in the uh, in the Franklin Roosevelt uh, 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 Memorial? Um, what happens when the Harry Truman Memorial comes? The George Bush Memorial? All of these other uh, uh, memorials. Uh, and school children are uh, brought to see these things, and uh, the state's um, uh, myth uh, uh, is uh, carried on from one generation uh, to another. Um, now, I want to talk about uh, something about the the uh, situation in regard to liberty in the present day. Uh, Hayek, I think, was quite right when he said in the, the last years of his life, well, uh, socialism... <laughs> is essentially dead. The traditional uh, standard socialist uh, program, nationalization of industry and central economic planning, well, now we know about the, the fall of uh, communism in, the, in Russia and Eastern Europe and, uh, and what's happening in China and so on, that no serious person defends the idea of central economic planning and uh, uh, nationalization of industry as the road to prosperity. Uh, the ones who do Practice it, as in, uh, I, I suppose, in Cuba, North Korea, and so on. Well, they're the hangers-on of the regime, that's, uh, regimes that have been there for for uh, decades. So, the, so it is the case that traditional socialism uh, has gone uh, uh, into oblivion. Hayek said, however, that socialism is being replaced by the welfare state, and this certainly is. 
the case. Discussing the welfare state uh, brings us back to the discussion of the origins of liberalism. Because liberalism arising in the 18th century uh, faced, as we know, absolutism, mercantilism, but also, which is not as well known, what it faced on, especially on the continent of, uh, of Europe, uh, was a welfare state in the version of that time. Um, it was called, oddly enough, the Polizeistaat, that is uh, uh, police state, but police meaning uh, uh, police in the sense of uh, regulation by the government. The aim, uh, there's a literature on this that I could be citing to you, and I, uh, as always, I'd uh, be willing to send you uh, citations if, uh, if you care to have them. So there's a, a great literature on, on, the, uh, on the subject. Uh, there's a book by uh, a man named Dorwart, D-O-R-W-A-R-T, uh, from Harvard University Press uh, on uh, the uh, history of the welfare state. And he um, uh, distinguishes three stages. The first was the welfare state that came into existence with the so-called enlightened despotism of the early modern period. And uh, that, was, that existed in France, that existed uh, in the German states, above all Prussia, it, it, it existed in the Austrian states. Uh, and there were uh, treatises written for the government bureaucrats who were going to be regulating uh, agriculture, uh, industry, uh, setting up hospitals, setting up educational institutions, insane asylums, uh, all the sort of things that were going to be uh, helping uh, uh, operating the poor laws, all the sort of things that were supposed to be helping people, all the different welfare uh, organizations. Treatises written for them, because they studied in universities, uh, that explain that the aim of the enlightened prince is the happiness and welfare of his people. And the government, and it's the government's job to look after this and to do everything it can to uh, extend and expand their happiness um, and, their, and their welfare. Um, that's why, if you look uh, at um, uh, the best, uh, the greatest book written in, 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 Germany, in, uh, in Germany on um, uh, on liberalism uh, before the rise of the Austrian school, and that is the limits of state action by the uh, great uh, German philosopher uh, Humboldt, Wilhelm von Humboldt. And translated into English, the limits of state action, again, a book available from the Liberty Fund. And he has, as a quotation at the beginning of his book, uh, something from one of the French uh, physiocrats uh, who... Um, lashed out against the rage to govern, which is the most disastrous disease of modern governments. Uh, this is what um, uh, actually was the elder Mirabeau uh, who said that, and this is what Humboldt was saying also. Uh, and what, what was his rage to govern? The welfare state that, he, that was coming into existence. One reason, by the way, why the philosopher Immanuel Kant says that happiness cannot be the aim of, um, of uh, ethics, uh, and uh, by implication of government action, uh, he was a, an, an opponent of the German wel- of the Prussian welfare state. So that, as Kant put it, justice, not happiness, has to be the aim of policy. Now, Dorwart, um, uh, this uh, scholar I mentioned, then talks about a second stage of the welfare state, which was the period of classical liberalism and the retreat of the state and the introduction of laissez-faire, and that lasted for a few decades in Europe. And then finally, the third stage begins, as I'll talk about in a moment, in the 1880s in Germany. Um, And it is the stage of the indefinitely expanding welfare state that we are privileged to experience today. Some people might be surprised um, that um, the welfare state came into existence in Prussia, well, Germany, Prussian-controlled Germany, under the aegis of Bismarck, whom I talked about last time. Bismarck was no friend of freedom. Um, He was, uh, in a a paternalistic way, a friend of common people and looking out for their welfare. But there were other reasons behind his introduction of welfare legislation into Germany in the 1880s. Odd as it may seem, we can pinpoint where the welfare, modern welfare state started, and it was there. 
He introduced uh, old age pensions, uh, disability uh, insurance, uh, health insurance, and um, other uh, welfare measures. The reason was, as uh, his conservative advisors uh, uh, agreed with him, that people were becoming too independent. Uh, they were, well, they were becoming, look, he lives in a, in, uh, in a monarchy. This is his whole life, service to the Hohenzollern kings and now emperors of Germany. Uh, they were be- becoming too independent. Uh, <coughs> the liberals, uh, who, uh, whom he considered his worst enemy, enemies worse than the socialists, uh, were depending on gradual improvement in conditions, people becoming even more independent. As they become indep- uh, more independent, they take care of other things, like their health insurance uh, provisions for old age and so on. And what's going to happen uh, to their gut loyalty to the government? Well, he said he had noticed under Napoleon uh, III in France, who started some of these welfare measures, that, uh, and, and Napoleon set up uh, pensions for certain categories of people. He had noticed that people who, who look forward to a government pension uh, tend to be much more amenable than uh, people who are acting on their own, getting uh, their, uh, uh, looking to their own f- uh, support in various ways to the private sector. Um, and uh, it was this political need, as one of his advisors said, to bind the people to the throne with chains of gratitude <coughs> that led to the introduction of these measures. <coughs> Bismarck was also clever enough to... Uh, to, uh, to um, uh, add to these uh, welfare uh, measures uh, the, a kind of gimmick that that is successful to this day. And that is, uh, in some cases, not all, in, uh, in, in regard to social uh, old age pensions, uh, for instance, talk about the employees and the employer's contribution. You know, divide it up as if uh, you're a worker and you're giving something into to this fund, but they're also getting your boss to give in some uh, to give something into the fund. Now, nothing is more certain than the, than your boss doesn't care how he divides up your salary. You know, if you tell him give seven and a half percent to Catholic charities, uh, send uh, uh, 45 percent to the Mises Institute, uh, or what, whatever way you want to divide it up, he's willing to do it because he is going to be paying you a certain amount what he thinks you're worth. worth. Uh, so that um, if uh, there were no employer's contribution, this is what a worker would be worth, and this is what a worker would be getting. But uh, this uh, optical illusion of, uh, of an employer's contribution certainly helped uh, this uh, um, uh, Bismarck's plan uh, plans along. Bismarck was opposed um, in, in these um, measures by the German liberals. Um, I have a book on on uh, the German liberalism in general that uh, Guido uh, Hilsmann translated into German uh, for me. But there's also an article in the JLS um, that you can look up under, to my mind, the greatest of, of these men, one of my real heroes, Eugen Richter, um, and the other German, authentic German liberals, Manchester liberals, opposed the welfare state, which is a major reason why German historians have total contempt for these for these uh, 19th century liberals. Uh, that is, that uh, they ignore them, they misinterpret uh, them, they distort what they said, uh, because, my heavens, these were actual Germans who were against welfare, who were against the welfare state, um, welfare state being enshrined in the constitution of the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, which is a social state, as they say, uh, given to human dignity, uh, also in these material terms of, of, uh, of supporting welfare. So these German liberals are, um, are not uh, treated very well by uh, historians, either uh, here or abroad, uh, but they came up with very good arguments uh, against the welfare state, uh, and in particular pointed out, you know, what's going to be the end of this? Um, people get the impression that the government has endless largesse uh, to distribute. Uh, what's going to uh, stop them from uh, just... Uh, uh, the government from uh, creating more and more programs, uh, taking more and more of the people's uh, income through taxes, and then uh, distributing it uh, through uh, alleged welfare measures. The German liberals, by the way, understood perfectly the mechanism that the School of Public Choice talks about. That is how uh, benefits are uh, um, uh, concentrated and costs are 
dispersed among the whole population and how this works in with um, modern electoral uh, politics. And um, my own view, uh, since I want to talk about the prospects for freedom, is that this uh, welfare state that exists now in Western countries is simply going to expand. There might be some, there might be some setbacks from time to time. Uh, but um, uh, as, for instance, in America, the Clinton health program to immediately socialize 14% of the American economy did not get through. On the other hand, what are we witnessing now? Prescription drugs for uh, uh, older people. And anything that's, that is for America's kids. I don't know when this concept came in of America's kids. Um, I, don't, I don't think it existed in, in our time, in earlier, in the earlier years. America's, what do you mean America's kids? You know, there's Mrs. Marino's kids, and there's uh, uh, Mrs. Fleischman's kids, uh, and there's uh, kids of different families, and the kids are in that family. They don't belong to some huge, unbelievable, you know, over a, a quarter of a billion, practically 300 million uh, a strong collective called America. Uh, but that argument of doing something for America's kids is unanswerable. Um, we should always keep in mind that uh, half of the population, by definition, uh, has an IQ of less than 100. Uh, so we, we see uh, in New York State, because uh, the states uh, are going into various speeds here, in New York State, there's one um, uh, um, aspect of socialized medicine after another that's put in. Now, for instance, there is a state-funded um, uh, insurance for all people who can't afford it otherwise, uh, who have children in their family. And that's coming in, in a few years. And the Republican governor uh, boasts about that. Uh, so it's a matter of time until something very like the original Clinton program uh, comes into existence. There might not be the coercion uh, that um, that was originally proposed, or else maybe if there's a Democratic president, there will be such a coercion. But the welfare state does experience defeats from time to time. Uh, but then it picks itself up and goes ahead to uh, greater and greater uh, victories. So this is what uh, we have to worry about, I think, in the modern world. Uh, but this welfare state has another uh, aspect to it that Paul Gottfried talks about. And I mentioned Gottfried's two books after liberalism and his more recent book on uh, multiculturalism. Um, the welfare state is a managerial state, uh, a therapeutic state, a state that is concerned to uh, radically redo the values and traditions of society. And what's more obvious than that? Uh, I don't know. Wasn't there uh, once on the uh, uh, Alabama uh, license plates uh, some phrase to the effect that Alabama was the heart of Dixie? Huh? I think there was. I think maybe the last time I was here there was. Uh, or at least there was a, that was on some license plates. Now it is virt it's virtually disappeared. I mean, literally disappeared. It's down in a in small print if you have some an Auburn license plate. Uh, now it's uh, so, so yeah, I know what, I know what it is, but I'm trying to figure out what the hell it means. <laughs> Stars fell on Alabama. Uh, I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> what, so what? This is a very small example, obviously, but what is it? Why? Why are they doing something like this? Of course, Alabama is the heart of Dixie. What, what else would it be? Uh, but the very, the very men, we're not talking racism here. We're talking about the very mention of the name Dixie uh, is now uh, taboo um, because of the state diktat. Uh, and in, in years to come, it's going to get worse. And I can't imagine what, what it would be, but it's going to get worse and worse. Uh, that, that's one aspect uh, of the states uh, having a, uh, an agenda uh, to uh, root out certain uh, uh, traditions and values in society, for instance, identification with the, uh, with the South, on the part of Southerners, and to substitute others. This is the managerial, uh, bureaucratic, therapeutic state that uh, Paul Godfrey talks about. And that state lends itself legitimacy through the welfare state, by buying off more and more constituencies. Um, well, I mean, you might say it started with the agricultural program that um, uh, favored the South, 
uh, under Roosevelt, the uh, southern uh, cotton growers and hog growers and, and uh, uh, corn growers and so on, um, in this way, uh, directing them in the direction of Washington, whereas they had been very uh, suspicious of Washington before. But now, every group in America that's worth uh, pandering to gets benefits and feels that it has a um, uh, stake in um, uh, in the modern uh, welfare uh, and warfare state. What could possibly represent an end to this? How, how could this end? I don't see that um, uh, the welfare state is going to come to an end by itself. What I see is that as it becomes uh, more and more uh, intractable, as we approach the crisis of the welfare state, they will, uh, the politicians, the people in control of the system, will bring in what has already been suggested by politicians in Europe, including in Germany, for instance, and that is we, what we need are young taxpayers to support the uh, now the old the pensions and medical care and uh, and so on for the retired older uh, non taxpayers now retired people and where are these young taxpayers to come from since the Europeans um, don't seem to be uh, I don't know if they've forgotten how to do it but <laughs> don't seem to be very interested in having kids. Um, and in America, uh, the white population does not, repl- uh, does not replace itself. So where are these uh, new taxpayers to come from? And that is then the third world, opening up the borders to immigration so we can get these uh, uh, new workers and we can tax them. And, of course, they're going to get old after a while, and they're probably going to have fewer kids. But that's going to be way in the distance, and the politicians who are worried about it now will be long since gone, and they don't have to worry about what's going to happen down the road. Typical of politics, typical of the whole, uh, uh, in, in implied necessarily in the logic of democratic politics. They don't have to worry what happens down the road. But what will, what will have happened in the meantime is that they will, would have, they will have destroyed the identity, uh, first of all, of the European nations. Um, there's no such thing as, a, 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 as far as I can see, of a France that's one third Muslim, or in, in Italy that, uh, that's one third Muslim. Uh, I mean, there's an Italian state, uh, but there's no such thing as an Italian identity uh, that is one-third uh, Muslim or more, for that matter. So they'll destroy the identity of the European peoples, uh, eventually also of the American people, although we have some uh, leeway for in our country. Uh, and um, I don't think anybody could have uh, predicted that. that. That's one thing that German liberals certainly never thought of, that it would come, it would come to that, that in order to salvage this never ending a system of welfare, one welfare program after another, more and more debt, uh, more and more taxes, uh, they would have to simply destroy uh, the uh, historical identity of the, of the countries. Um, now, well, uh, is, this, is this pessimistic? Well, it's kind of pessimistic, you might say. <laughs> but I'm not just pessimistic. Uh, by my contract with the Mises Institute, I cannot be just pessimistic. <laughs> so there has to be hope. By the way, uh, before I forget, if you want to know what I really think is going to happen, there's a novel by Ira Levin. I, sh- I notice that there are three copies in the library here. Called This Perfect Day. And uh, there's a rather brilliant review, as it happens, of this novel on uh, Lou Rockwell's uh, website in the archives. It's under my name. Um, now, Ira Levin, I think you know, although maybe not, but not, not that name. Rosemary's Baby, Stepford Wives, Boys from Brazil, um, uh, Kiss Before Dying, um, and uh, Death, Death Trap. He, he wrote all those. Stepford Wives. And um, he wrote this. If you check out one of the histories of the uh, uh, Objectivist uh, Institute, while he was attending Objectivist lectures in New York. This is his really quite libertarian work. And it's a futuristic work. So, it's a glimpse into the future. And uh, um, 
when it was in paperback and easily available, I, I gave out a lot of copies. I've never co- come across any libertarian who didn't at least try to read it in one sitting. Uh, you know, maybe at three in the morning it got too late and they had to finish it the next morning. But a look at the book. It's in the uh, on the library shelves. This perfect day. Um, it's on the uh, library shelves, and uh, it gives you an idea of what I think, anyway, uh, eventually might happen. It's futuristic, uh, um, uh, kind of 1984, but with a different uh, ending. Now, we've talked about classical liberalism in different uh, respects uh, this week. One thing uh, certainly was clear, I imagine, and that was that the liberals aimed to limit government. Government was to be limited to certain functions, um, things that the government had done historically. It was to leave alone. And uh, um, in many countries, the liberals thought that a means for doing this would be constitutionalism. Constitution is, by definition, something that limits the government. That is, it says what the government can do, and by implication, what the government can't do. In uh, France, uh, uh, the great liberal I mentioned, uh, maybe I wasn't able to get into as much detail on his views as uh, I uh, had hoped, Benjamin Constant spent a good deal of his life coming up with um, constitutional arrangements for France uh, after the Great Revolution. And, as we know, the, and, and uh, liberal uh, revolutions aimed very, uh, very often uh, principally at uh, setting up a constitution. On the European continent, uh, for instance, in the early 19th century, uh, in Spain, uh, during uh, the liberal uh, uh, agitation there, or in the d- different German states, uh, up until um, uh, Germany was uh, unified, setting up a constitution. Now, the United States Constitution is probably the most famous example of these liberal constitutions. The aim was to limit the government. And... The, the um, drafters tried as much as possible to do that, and just to nail it, nail it down, they uh, added some amendments to the Constitution, the first ten of which become the Bill of Rights. Um, by the way, unlike, uh, oh, I think it's about 25 or 30 percent of American students, I am sure that you are aware of, the fact that the Bill of Rights does not include the phraseology uh, to each according to his needs and from each according to his abilities. We all know about the famous Article 1, Congress shall make no law respecting a series of rights. And then, I don't know how many people have ever uh, put this uh, together uh, with that, that is the facts together, the Second Amendment, right after that, right after the uh, enumeration of these basic rights in religion, speech, uh, assembly, and so on. The Second Amendment comes, as uh, Blackstone said in uh, Commentary on the Laws of England, one of the major ways of defending our basic liberties. Uh, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That comes right after the Second Amendment. But let's go on to the end of the Bill of Rights, and you'd suppose, I mean, what more could you possibly put into writing that would guarantee a limited government and would guarantee the freedom of the people than this, Article 9. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. What does that mean? Well, these are not just the, the only, these are not the only rights people have. Uh, in fact, it's the other way around. The government has just a few powers, and the people are swimming in an ocean of rights. They have the right to have families, they have the right to travel, they have the right to educate their kids, they have one right after the other. And then Article 10, the last of the, of the uh, Bill of Rights. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it by, the sta- uh, to the, by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Okay, that nails it down, right? The federal government can only do precisely what is uh, what it's given authority to do in the body of the Constitution. So it was a heroic attempt to limit government, but very quickly 
the uh, Hamiltonian and then the Whig uh, tradition arose in America to expand the powers of the national government. And very quickly also, the national government's own Supreme Court set itself up as the ultimate arbiter of the Constitution, an interpreter of the Constitution. Very dangerous. Um, what was, what could be a protection against this? What could be a protection against the national government um, doing all kinds of things in the economy, protective tariffs, uh, so-called internal improve- improvements, uh, uh, pork for uh, meaning pork for uh, their uh, contractor friends and the railroads and so on, uh, printing money uh, that it forces on the people. What could prevent the federal government from doing that? Well, the states. There's the states. It's a federal system. Uh, and uh, in critical times, uh, some states even threatened secession when they thought that the federal government was going beyond its uh, legitimate powers. Uh, famously in the 1830s by South Carolina, over the tariff, not over slavery, over the tariff. But then um, there came to power in uh, the United States a party that was perceived by a large part of the uh, population as aiming to uh, implement once and for all the Hamiltonian and Whig program. That, that said, in its program, they were uh, going to be putting into effect a protective tariff, which would uh, the consequence of which would be to uh, fatally harm the um, uh, interests of the South. And uh, then secession came. Now, there have been a number of interesting um, pieces written on the Constitution of the um, Confederate States of America. One, which is, um, I'm not sure on the Mises uh, website, but I'll give you the citation from the Southern Economic Journal of 1992 by a friend of the uh, Institute, Randall Holcomb, um, who points out that the um, uh, uh, framers of the Southern uh, um, Constitution very well understood principles of, of public choice, so that the um, their legislature was prohibited from uh, set from uh, erecting protective tariffs and um, uh, giving special favors, bounties, and so on to industry. Uh, Marshall De Rosa, who has spoken at the Mises Institute, uh, has discussed the Confederate uh, Constitution in a little book and uh, come to sim- similar conclusions. That is, that the Confederate Constitution, because of the experience of the American people up until that time, was dedicated to uh, preventing um, uh, the, um, uh, the Confederate government from acting the way the federal government uh, had acted. This was um, the last uh, great attempt to, uh, to thwart the will of Washington, and it, was, and it came down to a, to a struggle of arms. Uh, as it had in England in the uh, in the 17th century, uh, as it had with the uh, Italian city-states against the uh, German emperor in the 12th century, as it had with uh, uh, people uh, fighting for their freedom at different times in history. Um, and before you bring in the uh, the question of slavery, why don't uh, I, th- I think maybe you might consider uh, what uh, a great uh, lover of the slaves like uh, uh, General Sherman. Uh, had in mind, uh, going from Atlanta to the sea, burning, deliberately, consciously burning every possible means of subsistence in his way. What were the tens and tens of thousands of slaves on the plantation supposed to be living on when the Union soldiers killed all the chicken and livestock and burned all the, uh, uh, the cornfields and destroyed all the other means of subsistence? Um, no concern for the slaves there, it seems. So that um, the uh, South was defeated, and as Lord Acton uh, wrote to Robert E. Lee, uh, that was the end, as, as far as he could see, of the limit to the um, uh, sovereignty of the one pow- uh, power center in Washington. Um, Acton supported the Southern cause, not because he was a friend of slavery, but because he thought this was the one bulwark, the one possible possible bulwark against federal tyranny, 
the right of secession of the states. Um, and now there seems to be there seems to be uh, no uh, limit, no institutional limit, no theoretical limit to what the national government can do. You say, uh, uh, well, we still have the Bill of Rights. The, it, the, well, yeah, we have the Bill of Rights, but the Bill of Rights has to be interpreted. It's interpreted by the federal Supreme Court. Right? We know already that commercial, we'll take the, uh, the First Amendment, we know that commercial speech is not privileged speech, right? A pornographic speech, of course, is not privileged speech. That it's not speech per se that's privileged, that Congress may not infringe on. So what happens when the uh, five or six majority uh, liberals on the, uh, liberals so-called, on the Supreme Court, uh, maybe uh, graduates of the law schools, which are preaching this very point today, decide that hate speech is not privileged speech, that it doesn't come under the protection of the First Amendment. And hate speech can include everything that you might uh, uh, think of including. Uh, hate speech uh, says, uh, hate speech would include, uh, might very well include, it could be argued in court, uh, hate speech includes, uh, well, we have to stop with, uh, uh, do away with welfare in New York City. Well, that's hate speech because it's, uh, the implication is clearly uh, that we should do away with welfare for minority populations, which are the great bulk of the people who get welfare in New York City. Um, this seems uh, strange to you. I would suggest that political correctness a few, a couple of decades ago, and the extent to which it's, uh, it's gone in America and Europe would have seemed very strange. But my point being that the Bill of Rights, per se, is not going to be any protection of our liberties. So what to do? Um, ever since uh, I, I translated Mises' uh, liberalism uh, many years ago, and even before that, I've been interested in the history of classical liberalism. And uh, most of my research has concerned that. And I am uh, coming to a conclusion, which I held theoretically, but uh, feel uh, more strongly about and hold, you might say, practically now, that there is no answer within classical liberalism. The liberals had no answer because they strove to preserve the state. And uh, I say I, I held this view theoretically because I agreed with Murray Rothbard, uh, my old friend, that uh, ultimately the kind of system we want is a system of uh, where individuals are um, empowered to select their own uh, means of defense, their own, uh, let's say, defense agencies, their own courts, just as they select uh, any other service of theirs. So I held that for a long time. But now what I'm, what I'm telling you uh, is that um, it's very clear that there is no way of salvaging limited government. Um, it's uh, simply going to be getting worse and worse. So our uh, more direct and immediate aim has to be to destroy the centralized state, to do away with the centralized state uh, in stages. Uh, I'm not talking violent the revolution. As a matter of fact, I hope that uh, uh, the leaders of the United States, President Bush, uh, um, Ariel Sharon, and the other uh, uh, leaders of the United States, um, uh, I, I hope they live forever. And <laughs> Okay. I, uh, and I, I wish them well. So I'm not I'm, uh, joking aside. Obviously, I'm not talking about violence. There's no point to vi start violence and uh, and see what happens. We're going to be like uh, uh, like uh, the Branch Davidians or, uh, all over again. So it, it has to be, of course, uh, education and, and and political action. But the aim has to be to break down the central state. And when I say by any means necessary, I mean, for instance, by secession. And the Mises Institute has a whole book of very interesting scholarly essays on the question of secession. Secession of provinces, as, for instance, Lombardy uh, in uh, Italy. Uh, let's hope the Basques and uh, the Catalans get their independence. Uh, in Spain, Corsica uh, from France. The breakup of Belgium, the sooner it happens, uh, the better. And uh, uh, I don't know where the EU bureaucrats are going to um, escape to, but wherever they uh, they go, we, they, they take our best wishes with them. Uh, <laughs> so the, the breakup of, uh, uh, of of states down into provinces, into cities. 
Now, if uh, Lombardy is going to succeed from uh, Italy, I don't understand why Verona has to has to uh, 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 be enslaved under, under the tyranny of Milan. Uh, so we want to uh, we want that, and then finally down to the secession of any individual uh, who wants to see to his own uh, defense, the de- uh, defense of himself and his family. Uh, and it doesn't have, you don't have to think in terms of some uh, some family in Idaho or something, or, or except all the best to them. All they want to do, is, as far as I can see, is uh, is live their own lives by themselves, uh, as they as they as the Weaver family did at Ruby Ridge, and, until the federal government got interested. But I don't mean necessarily that. I mean, for instance, um, uh, proprietary communities. Um, a company can get together, buy land in a certain area, and uh, uh, provide also for the security, the uh, uh, police um, uh, of that area, and you, you uh, uh, rent or you buy some property from this company and they take care of your security interest as they take care of the water interest, the electricity interest, whatever else might be involved. And there you have a um, um, an independent community. Uh, that uh, Those communities, by the way, can be on the basis of religious uh, affiliation, on the basis of other values of some kind, um, uh, so that uh, what we what we have, people talk about diversity. They don't mean diversity. What they mean is every place in the country being having exactly the same composition. Uh, diversity would be if you have it, uh, an area like Alabama, and you have communities of blacks, you have com- and then you have communities of uh, people who prefer to uh, to remain among themselves, whites or Scotch. Uh, Irish or, or Italians or homosexuals or heterosexual uh, families that want to keep homosexuals out, uh, that would be a collection of diverse communities. And um, uh, it seems to me that uh, this all has to be worked out. I mean, we're not going to do it tomorrow. Uh, but it seems to me it would be very uh, uh, possible uh, for these communities to see to their own self-defense as well. As a matter of fact, in a... In a uh, uh, in a community where people tend to be of one kind, among their own kind, it would be easier to, to uh, see to the prevention of uh, ordinary crime, I think, than in uh, uh, some uh, Babylon like uh, uh, like New York or Washington, for that matter. Uh, in any case, this I think is the um, is the only uh, hope, on, unless you can suggest uh, something else. I don't think classical liberalism is um, um, is uh, is possible anymore, and uh, I guess uh, I, I assumed that this would go without saying. What you have to read in connection with this, and really one of the finest books written in recent years, and it uh, has become uh, quite a bestseller, translated now into a number of European languages, and that is the book by Professor Hopper called Democracy. The God That Failed. The God That Failed refers to a famous book of the 1950s, a collection of essays by ex-communists called, uh, called The God That Failed, and it was about communism. So um, Hans Hoppe outlines uh, and, and backs up much of what I've said in the last few minutes um, with um, uh, a panoply of arguments. Finally, uh, just to uh, remind you of what uh, we've done uh, this week. Basically, we've gone into uh, uh, the study of, of history. History is a struggle of liberty and um, how history came out of, uh, how liberty came out of Europe, uh, how uh, uh, liberty developed uh, in Europe, the history of classical liberalism, uh, how it was faced with various uh, enemies. But um, the um, uh, Basis of uh, everything we've done, I think, is is the feeling that I have and that the Mises Institute has that history is uh, is a very important part of of understanding the, the uh, case of uh, for liberty and the uh, the possibilities of uh, liberty. It's not uh, an accident that uh, George Orwell in 1984 talks about history and the rewriting of history, the constant rewriting of history by the men in power and the tyrants. And there's a, uh, a mantra or, or a uh, saying that uh, goes through the book, uh, he who controls the past controls the future, and he who controls 
The present controls the past. He who controls the past controls the future because people make up their minds about what they want and what they will support and what they will fight for very often on the basis of their understanding of history, as we talked about when we talked about the Industrial Revolution. He who controls the present controls the past uh, because the past doesn't exist by itself. Oh, you know, there are, uh, uh, there are uh, written records, but in or- or Orwell's world, those records can simply be destroyed or, or obliterated, uh, fabricated. Uh, there are gravestones, there are coins, I mean, there are residues. But basically, those who um, control the interpretation of the past control the past. People at the present time who, because of their positions of power, control uh, the understanding that people have of the past can control it, and in that way control the future. And we don't want to be in that uh, kind of position. Um, as an Italian, uh, Italo-American, I go back off into Machiavelli, who was not a nice man, but he was a very s- smart man and a very sharp man. And in uh, The Prince, he talks about uh, how men who want power can gain power. And, uh, uh, and what the nature of power is and what the nature of politics is, And he says, look, I'm writing for a few people. This is in just what he says. I'm writing for a few people. I'm not writing for the mass of people. Uh, The mass of people prefer appearance to reality. Uh, They prefer their fantasy to to what actually exists. If they knew what politics really was, uh, they wouldn't have uh, a a good night's sleep for the rest of their lives. Okay? Uh, it really is scary. And there are only some men of strength, some, some men of power, some men of force uh, who can deal with this. The average person, born to be sheep, and as, uh, um, as another Italian uh, Pareto said, uh, he who plays the sheep will find the butcher. Uh, so that um, for, uh, uh, I think that uh, here we see some of the value beyond uh, simple interest, which is good enough. Uh, in historical studies. Thank you. Now, now this time we have um, a good deal of time, plenty of time really, for gen- uh, questions. Anything that came up uh, this week, uh, anything that came up uh, today, and ideas you might have about uh, the status of freedom and in uh, the world today, in our society today, and the prospects. Quick, yep. When was Humboldt's what? Time? Sorry, Humboldt's time period again? Uh, he, he wrote uh, Limits of State Action in the mid-1790s. Okay. But he lived uh, to about 1832. Okay. Chantal? I just wanted to say, for those who are interested in uh, Levinson, it's available online. All it, of- is that true? In English? <laughs> really? Who? Huh? <laughs> And in French, yeah, okay. Um, uh, can you uh, uh, give an idea of where? What? Oh, sorry. <laughs> hey, boss, what can I do? I mean, uh, yeah. Oh. Oh, I see. Huh. Another, another plot. Um, okay, yeah, uh, yeah, I guess I meant uh, the Mises. But it, whatever, JLS is what? Uh, is under... It wasn't the JLS, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, you're right. You're right. But they should both be on the website. Right, it was in the, under the uh, old review of uh, Austin Economics uh, that's on the Mises website. As well as your excellent review of the book on the starvation market. Yeah, okay, Joe, please. <laughs> 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 I mean, Joe, you're embarrassing me. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry? Who was responsible for the quote about EU controls? That's from George, George Orwell. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Ed. I think that all socialist leaders are evil. You th- think who's evil? And I think all socialist leaders are evil. Okay. And I agree with you that Hitler was evil. However, 
that, think you're saying Hitler? And, and I think Hitler, the, 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 the well known, the famous? Well, okay. Okay, but that's not, yeah, yeah, but, uh, but Ed, that's not, okay, Ed, excuse me, but that's not one of the central things I was talking about. Who's more evil, Hitler, Stalin, Roosevelt, and so on. Okay, I appreciate uh, uh, your point of view, but I, uh, but I uh, take it for granted that you agree with me that Hitler certainly was evil. Yeah, well, all right. Well, at least um, we, we, we have a breakthrough here. Uh, any other questions, comments? Feel free to say anything that you want to say. Yeah. One uh, thing you mentioned about uh, Bismarck's uh, social programs, which started around 1875, 1880. Mm-hmm. The same thing happened in England about 30 years later to abolish the mutual assistance groups. And there were living funders that sometimes through religion, sometimes through uh, uh, from just societies of sure. friends. Some, Friendly societies, they were often called. Uh, and that was one of the first thing to do is to eliminate. Anything. Well, so they eliminated. The yeah. yeah, they eliminated them uh, mainly by uh, by uh, uh, by giving free government programs instead. The uh, British welfare state came into uh, existence uh, a few years before the uh, uh, First World War, and it's as clear as anything how it came into existence. Um, and that is that Lloyd George, who is the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, and his assistant uh, Winston Churchill went to Germany and saw, uh, this was uh, around uh, 1908 or so, uh, saw uh, Bismarck, of course, long dead, long dead um, saw the Bismarckian system in operation, and Churchill says, which you, you can find in my Churchill uh, article in that book, Churchill said, this is a great system, uh, we have to have a big, s- yeah, okay, please. Uh, uh, we have, a, uh, have to add a big slice of Bismarckianism to our English scene. Uh, what, what Churchill and Lloyd George saw were the uh, uh, electoral advantages of supporting welfare legislation. So it was under Lloyd George and the uh, liberal uh, Asquith administration before the First World War that the first welfare uh, measures were put into effect in England. Uh, so that the connection, the connection between uh, Germany and England is as, uh, as clear as anything. And uh, what uh, Dr. Prince is getting at is this. Tocqueville, uh, in um, uh, visiting America and also visiting uh, England, which he loved, his wife was uh, English, said the English-speaking people, the, Eng- the uh, Anglo-Saxons, uh, he meant also the uh, Celtic people, and their descendants uh, have a genius for free association. America is the best example of this. You go to America, and in any community, the people get together and do everything that's necessary. You need a public library. Uh, you need uh, a, a fire department. You need a bridge. Uh, you need an extension on the road. The people do it themselves. In France, people get together and apply to uh, Paris, to the appropriate bureau, to, uh, to fund and, and direct and, and create whatever they need. But the, he says... The uh, English people and their descendants uh, are, have a genius for free association. Now, by the end of the 19th century, uh, in England, as you say, uh, they had come into existence a huge number of what we generally call friendly societies. Um, you know, working people, uh, not so affluent people, have been concerned about various needs that they and their family have had. Uh, they've always been concerned. Back in Roman times, groups of uh, workmen would get together, and the major thing was to arrange for a funeral, uh, for a, a grave uh, site uh, in, when they died. Or, you know, working people are, are, are human beings. Poor people are human beings. Uh, worry about something like that uh, and give uh, small contributions each time. So by voluntary association, voluntary uh, contributions, arranging for these things. Now, by the time this came into existence, uh, uh, these problems uh, uh, came to the fore, uh, with a great working class, let's say, in England at the end of the 19th century, uh, you had a vast number of associations for all kinds of things, uh, for sickness, even for unemployment, which would seem to uh, raise questions of moral hazard, um, a burial, of course, and uh, uh, old age, and so on. In America, you had similar associations. 
um, and um, uh, David Beto, B-E-I-T-O, of the University of Alabama, uh, has examined these. Uh, they were very often um, uh, uh, ethnically divided. And a reason for that is uh, you would have a problem, a moral hazard problem, that is people kind of exploiting or taking advantage of the system. But let's say somebody uh, said that, um, well, he was ill, too ill to go to work, and could he get some compensation? Well, it makes a difference if his friends, if his paisans, uh, come to him and visit him and and uh, and uh, know something about the traditions, the the way of life of the family, because it's their way of life, come to a conclusion. You know, is he faking or malingering or is he really ill? So it tended to be on uh, divided often on uh, ethnic grounds. The largest such group for, of, uh, of uh, insured people in Chicago, for instance, at a certain time were blacks. We're talking about 1890 and uh, so on. Uh, black families that, that saw to their own family needs of uh, uh, insurance uh, for health, for old age, and so on. Now, this didn't cover everybody, but then the government gets into the uh, picture, uh, gives out a subsidy, so you don't have to uh, pay very much at all, and naturally these various voluntary associations die away one after the other. Yeah? If uh, Tokyo referred specifically to uh, English-speaking people, then I don't believe you could have been referring to the Celts, because at that time the Celtic-speaking people still spoke uh, varieties of Gaelic. Yeah. It was only no, no, I'm talking, Ben, really, that's a very trivial point. When I, I said the Anglo-Saxon... I said the Anglo-Saxons in America, okay? And then I said the Celtic people uh, uh, also. Not because they were speaking any, any Celtic language in America, but because in Appalachia and other places, they were the descendants of these uh, Scotch, uh, Irish, and the Scots, okay? Do you want perhaps to raise something of, uh, of uh, 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 greater significance than that? What? <laughs> Come on, Ben, you can think of something better than that. Okay, yeah. I have sort of a broad question. There's been a, somewhat of a debate raging amongst some of the fellows this summer about uh, being pragmatic or practical in pursuit of liberty. Yeah, and, you and what know, does like, that mean exactly? We don't live in a, a perfectly uh, unhampered market. Yeah. So, you know, the basic idea is that you know, we, we, should, we can't really promote these things. These principles of liberty because they don't really apply. So oh, is that right? We have, that's, we have to take baby steps. Okay, it that's very interesting. Okay, uh, would you care to name some names? <laughs> I, who, has, do that. who has been presenting this point of view? Come on, you know who you are. <laughs> um, well, uh, it's possible. What does anybody think about that? Absurd. It's absurd. Why is it absurd? Well, 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 I'm going to say one thing. Wait, wait, wait. For, we can't just have a, a, a dictum from you. What, why is it absurd? Because you have to have, um, you have to have a standard that you're moving towards. And if, if you don't recognize the, the truth of what works, then there's no reason to even move towards it. Seems like well, a logical point. No, it's more, it's not that the, the certain people don't have that, that end point and focus. Sure. You know, it, it's just the means of, of yeah. achieving those ends, which differ. Wait a minute. What do you, why, why? We, have, we have the goal in mind. It's what's the person? <laughs> I, just want to, I just want everybody to see you, see who's talking. Go ahead. Well, we have like the six foot eight, mind. I think people will see him. We have the end in mind. It's just we've been kind of debating what is the correct way to kind of you know, spread the word mm -hmm. and um, move towards that. Okay. Um, and what do you think the correct way is? That's what we're debating. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You wanted to say something, Kerr? No, no, well. Maybe I misunderstood uh, what was going on, yeah. but I, I would say that sometimes uh, libertarian principles can be conflicted in the real world. And what I, what I should in the real world, you think? In the real world. Huh, how would that be? For? What would be an well, example since, of that? Since, since uh, if we do have a government and a welfare state that are not built on libertarian principles, you will many time, times have that people's rights are in conflict. Or very, it's very hard to interpret uh, how to apply libertarian principles in a conflicting world. Hmm. Um, would, you, would you disagree with that? Well, I'm not sure exactly. How about an example? Well, an, an example could be 
I don't know if that was what uh, Jeff was referring to, but I had, had, a, had, a, had a big discussion with Jeff uh, when we were eating Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> that, that one, I'll one, take your word for it over here. So, uh, so you have a situation you consider, uh, on many people, if not most people, consider being a, a great threat. And you have a, the threat coming from a, a, a group of people that is identifiable. However, some are, some in this group of people are, mm-hmm. of course, uh, innocents. Oh, huh. No. And, and have no bad intentions. I suppose not to do anything. Uh huh. Just wait for the death. The, the, the harm yeah. To well, you think maybe the, for instance, Muslims. Yeah, for instance. My, I would say to be to start as, as starters that whenever you see a group of five young Arabs, males, buying one-way tickets, first class, <laughs> from Logan Airport to Los Angeles, paying with cash and having no luggage, um, that, that um, uh, in that case, we could have, if we did not have government uh, uh, regulations about uh, racial discrimination, I think we could have left it to American Airlines uh, to ask this group of five young Arabs to step aside and explain themselves a little bit. Well, that would be my point. You know, right. you, can, you can apply those criteria. No, but but private property would have taken care of that. Well, but we do not have private defense agencies as it is now, right? We well, have a threat now, but we do not have all of these private oh. institutions to help us. Um, well, okay, uh, uh, then I guess I didn't understand uh, what your example would be. Well, if you well, if you talk about ter- if you talk about terrorists uh, about to uh, commit some terrorist act, uh, even short of uh, you know, <coughs> throwing a bomb or something or bringing uh, uh, taking out a bomb, in a, in a case like that where there was a, uh, some strong uh, possibility or even some possibility that a terrorist act was uh, uh, being planned. There, the private uh, airline company, if it had been given its own way, could have taken care of well, it. They have not bought an air, airplane ticket. They what? They have not bought an airplane Oh, yeah, ticket. okay. They are their own property scheming and collecting uh, mm-hmm. the, the dynamite or whatever. You, uh-huh. You, you would say, well, they have not harmed anyone yet. So uh, maybe they will not. No. They will not. So, so you no, no. Right. Yeah. Look, there are... There, um, a lot of different uh, uh, questions that are dealt with by law, uh, that is a lot of l- different legal questions. Where is there, um, where d- does probable cause come in and permit us to uh, take certain measures? Now, where does probable cause of, of, a, of, a, of the commission of a felony come in uh, that would permit us then uh, to take various measures? Um, a, law- a lawyer, a libertarian lawyer, a lawyer who believes in private defense agencies. For instance, uh, Randy Barnett, professor of law at, uh, at uh, Boston University, would be a better person to deal with that because, uh, and I've heard him deal with questions like that, because he knows how law is adjudicated and how, uh, and how questions of probable cause occur in the state system, how it's likely to occur also in a private system. Um, private defense agencies would also operate on the basis of defending their customers, uh, and uh, not against simple immediate threats where there's a gun to their head, but uh, in cases where it is likely that there will be a threat to them. I mean, the private the defense agencies would also be interested in that. Yeah. And and um, uh, the the issue comes up now for there are no private defense agencies that can do anything like that. The, the issue comes out, up now for government agencies. I mean, there there it's a problem when they're entitled to do something and. And uh, when they're not. But would you agree that well, uh, that you can put off criteria that that people, if if people behave in certain uh, suspicious ways, that you you know could act be- before they have done anything? Well, any, any harm? No, how, you know, the, it's a question of uh, uh, the, the, there's not any particular criterion that can decide that. It is very much a question of a circumstance. That that's why they talk about probable cause. That's why they talk about presenting the evidence for probable cause to a judge. Who then will give a warrant for a search or whatever? Yes, you. I just want to point out that in these situations where we, you know, debate the the uh, idea of well, what's the libertarian law going to be like? How's the private defense company going to work? 
how do we apply that to the existing situation with the state, the federal control, and so forth? Um, lost in the bigger perspective is this <coughs> point that the state and those who want to use state power to politicize a police society, they themselves don't even go do these practical things when they have the power to do them. That's not the people they target. Um, when I was in the Air Force and we got ready to go to war with Albania, I was in Spokane, Washington, where there was a large Russian and Serb community there. You mean Sh- Serbia? Albania is in Wag the Door. Right, right. But I mean, when we went to war, in, it was in, in Kosovo, I apologize. Again, supporting the Albanians. Mm-hmm. There's a large Serb community there. The people on base, all they were talking about was, do you think these Serbs could be trusted to support the war? Or do you think they might cause problems? Maybe a Serb will drive out to the base and, and uh, you know, explode a, with a car bomb or something. That's what that's what they fret about. They don't fret about the private the property of American citizens. They fret about the power of the state. And the long term issue here is delegitimizing the state, destroying and delegitimizing the central government. Yeah. One way or another. You have to have history to do that. Yeah. You have to reach yeah. out to people to do that. Well I agree I agree with you basically, but I think what Pear is bringing up, what do you do in the meantime? Let's say you're uh, uh, deconstructing the state by practical issues come up all the time, and uh, how's that to be decided? I, don't, I certainly don't believe any and of this is easy. I can add, add uh, one thing. You were saying what, I, what I'm saying, uh, but I think, you know, that, that the state is a huge enemy. I agree with that. No doubt about it, but there are also other enemies, mm-hmm. and, and we have to take things in proportion, and you can have an imminent big threat. Mm-hmm. You know, where your, your, your government might be your best instrument as it is now, and then you can the government is not going to help you there. They won't help you there. They don't. There's no record of them doing so. Well, uh, it's, it's, po- it's possible, but of course, everything depends on circumstances. Wait a minute. What do we have back here? Wait a minute. What is this? An, uh, an anarchical element? Do you want to say something? Do you want to, do you want to say something? Say something. <laughs> say something or else I'll beat you within an inch of your life. <laughs> You see, there's, there's some people who just don't understand free discussion. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Oh, okay. Wait a minute, but uh, what about on this issue or something else? Okay. Go ahead. What's your question? So how do you how do you view? You know, I don't want to get into again. The role intellectual. Hmm. Well, why is that? Is it unclear from what I've said? Well, I mean, who who is going to tell? Sh- <laughs> Then the ultimate, so to say, fighter or, or promoter of the cause of liberty, ordinary people, or, or um, that, that's if you think about it, that doesn't that doesn't, the question doesn't have an answer, does it? How do you know? How could I tell you who's going to be the uh, who's going to be the ultimate fighters? Intellectuals have a disproportionate influence because they create ideologies, and human beings uh, find ide- ideologies. Uh, very often attractive. But um, one thing, uh, so I, I don't know how to, I really don't know how to, how to answer that in particular. Some last couple, a question or two? Uh, mine was in response to what we were discussing before. Yeah. Um, about this whole concept of probable cause and then preemptive caution. Uh, Dr. Michael Salibo presented a paper at the Austrian Scholars Conference which talked about how the, the idea of targets for terrorists are always changing. Like mm-hmm. your, your five Muslim men example. Mm-hmm. The fact of the matter is, is that you, you stated that as we all know this. Well, everyone knows this. So therefore, that's going to be the last thing that anyone would do. So that's not the top thing you need to be looking for anymore. The top thing you need to be looking for could be something completely different. Sure, yeah. But on the other, on the, on the other hand, uh, on uh, what was it, September 10th, or September 11th, for all I know, when they bought the tickets, uh, the possibility of hijacking was in the minds of many people. I think that, a, that if American Airlines had been given its, uh, uh, its choice, it would, have, it would have questioned these men. But, it, uh, but on the other hand, they would have been afraid they'd be sued um, for um, uh, racial discrimination. But you're right, uh, uh, the terrorist targets do uh, change. I don't think it's going to be another case of, uh, of, of using a, a plane as a bomb, whatever it's going to be, it's going to be terrible. Yeah. Well, my, my original question wasn't directed at Pear, necessarily. 
But I was just talking more in general. Because, you know, what I sort of interpreted from what you said is we should be uncompromising in our liberty, especially mm -hmm. those of us who us want to go into academia. Yeah. And I know people that have gone into Mises University with, that have gone on to PhD programs in economics. And, mm -hmm. you know, I talk to them and they say, well, you know, neoclassical economics is not that bad. You know, mm -hmm. get a job. So I'll, I'll remember that I'm an Austrian, you know, somewhere down the road, like, mm -hmm. it's convenient. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest problem with our, our entire like, movement, our efforts. So, so what I've interpreted from what you've said this week is, you know, don't be on, don't, don't compromise. Oh no, I'm don't not be ashamed of, of yeah. promoting liberty. No, 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 I'm not. I'm not telling you to, to act in any, in any particular way in your professional or uh, uh, or social life. Not at all. As a matter of fact, I think that um, for a graduate student, there's no particular reason to bring up your political views, uh, your scientific, uh, economic views, are something different. I mean, I don't see how you can stay away from, uh, get away from that. Um, if you're going to be in, let's say, in a, you're an economist, right? If you're going to be an economist. But a friend of mine, Mario Rizzo, uh, for instance, uh, got a PhD with great ease at the University of Chicago in the days of uh, Stigler and, uh, and Friedman and learned Chicago economics. And, but he was an Austrian. He was an Austrian from the word go, uh, cause he, uh, was a good friend of Murray Rothbard before he went to Chicago. And, uh, so it's possible, uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh Get ahead, uh, uh, having uh, Austrian views, but I'm not telling you that, and I don't, I don't think it's a good idea to broadcast your views to everybody. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, probably there are a lot of people who shouldn't know about your views. Um, sometimes you get there. There are libertarian students. Okay, you know, God bless them, salt of the earth. Uh, but then what they do is they go to college and they write um, uh, libert on libertarian issues for every course. Uh, like for their French, French course, they would write about Bastiat. And, um, uh, you know, in, in world history, they would write revisionist uh, stuff and, uh, and, and literature on maybe Ayn Rand, let's say. And, uh, I don't know, yeah, that's no way to, uh, that's not any way to get a liberal education. And, and why, uh, uh, why spend your, uh, your time in college like that? Your pur your, the purpose of, of your being in college or then in, in grad school is not to change the world um, from the position you're in. The, the purpose is to get an education and to get pro, uh, uh, professional credentials. Um, now, I don't think you're going to want to uh, dissemble uh, or lie if uh, it, it comes to that, if it comes point blank. But I certainly am not uh, saying that you should go out and, and broadcast to everybody what your views are. As far as uncompromising goes, well, what do you mean? Somebody says, um, uh, what do you think of the minimum wage? And what are you going to tell them? Well, the minimum wage should be lowered, right? Is that what you think? Or do you think the minimum wage should be abolished? What? Am I am I am I talking in Hungar Hungarian suddenly? Or nobody seems to be understanding me. Uh, you're not going to say the minimum wage should be lowered to whatever you know, four dollars and fifty cents an hour. Uh, I, I, I presume, uh, like where most economists, not even you don't have to be Austrian about it. But you'd say that you abolish the minimum wage. Huh? So, so I'm not sure in what case you would be compromising. Uh, what about the Fed? Uh, I think Friedman is in favor of abolishing the F Fed now, isn't he? Huh? huh? What? No, no, he's very, very skeptical of, of the Fed and the Fed's power to do anything uh, because of the... Um, uh, the lag between getting any reliable statistics and then the Fed acting in a certain way and then uh, uh, producing the desirable effect. In any case, um, uh, well, leaving aside a particular, exam particular examples, is there anybody who wants to bring up some other point? One last point. Yes. Uh, I'm always curious why is it that some people are getting more radical uh, as they get older? people for some reason subdue their ideas, even if they do not really risk their careers or you know, they, there is simply no good reason why to do it. Uh, mm. One point is, I mean, one, one example is, for example, Douglas Moore, who tried it for his whole life, Chicago, fuel efficiency and all this stuff, and then he signed a petition to support Clinton for the Air Socialization Plan. Is that true that he did? I, I, I don't... I don't know. You, it's true that he, that Nor, uh, Douglas North did? Or, so, uh, I'm surprised to hear that. Well, you, you used the man, Roy Child wrote a wonderful book about the Air Force. Mm -hmm. 
wonderful article recited <laughs> by me and the world through mm-hmm. other stages. And then at the end, he started to write an article saying that I was wrong all the time. And he died in the middle of writing. You know, the now, Roy was a good friend of mine. Yeah. And um, um, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him, but uh, uh, he was a, a big influence in the libertarian movement and uh, also in the libertarian party, worked for Cato, and then uh, was um, in charge of books at Laissez Faire Books, and um, uh, quite an uh, original individual. Now, uh, in uh, previous articles of his, he loved writing articles. He wrote an attack or criticism because he was a friend of Nozick's, but a criticism of Nozick defending. The anarcho-capitalism against Nozick, and I think also against Ayn. Um, and, but as you say, towards the end of his life, he began telling people that he discovered the secret, a secret argument in favor of the state. Uh, nobody ever found out what that argument was. He didn't even give a hint of what that argument might be. Um, and, uh, and then he, he died because he was um, really very uh, uh, ill. Uh, that, Aside from that, which uh, I don't know, maybe was a joke even, or uh, or some kind of uh, uh, role that uh, Roy was playing, uh, I don't think that he became less um, radical. Uh, if you're here uh, next week, you'll see an example of somebody who's become more radical, and that's uh, Robert Higgs. <laughs> uh, Murray, of course, remained as radical from the beginning, from the, really from the beginning when um, he was a grad student at uh, at uh, Columbia until the end, when in the 1948 uh, election he supported Strom Thurmond uh, for president uh, against um, the, uh, se- the uh, secessionist type, uh, the guy who got into, into got, uh, who did he get into, he got uh, Trent Lott into, into trouble recently. So Murray was radical and, and on one side or another uh, until the very end. Um, anybody want to speak to this gentleman's question? How many people are getting, feel they're getting more radical as time goes on? Okay. How many people are feeling less radical? <laughs> Can't you? Okay. Thank you. I think Chantal um, has a, uh, a request to make. I just wanted to take a picture of the group the life the life So since, since you probably cannot be identified from the back of your head anyway, where do you want people to sit? Wait a minute. What? Wait a minute. What's going on here? Hold on a second. What's going on here? Take a picture. I'm gonna go with you instead, so that you have the whole group and me too. But we, then we don't have Mason. Okay. Well, everybody's gonna come here. We're gonna have a group picture. How's that? I'll send you a copy. Would you like that? No, I'm not. A, no, I, I'm not. I don't take photographs very well. That's really. what I wanted to do. <laughs> Why did you allow this kid to take over? <laughs> okay, Mason, come on to the front here. He t- gets taller every day, have you noticed? Well, yeah. T- you're, you're, you're at least two inches taller than you were at the beginning of the week. <laughs> Come on, guys. Jeremy, what's wrong? Yeah. Andre. Aww. He's Canadian. He doesn't think he can get back into the country. <laughs> come on, Ed. We've got to get closer, come on, come on, though, come don't on, come we? On, come on. we got to get closer, right? <laughs> uh, ben, uh, no, ben you're, uh, you're hidden. Okay. You guys on the end come around front here. Well, okay. Okay, take one. Right, 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 right. <laughs> say cheese, now smile. Everybody say, right, go. Very good. Thank you so much. You're welcome.